Hello everyone and welcome to Unit 2, Intermediate Fishing. We're going to get a little deeper than we did in Unit 1. Unit 1 was just a, a basic introduction to, to fishing. Unit 2 we're going to take a little deeper dive, get a little bit more into the science of fish and fishing and have some fun. We're going to start off by talking about fish and conservation and we'll begin with fish anatomy. Now if you remember from last uh, the last unit we talked about the swim bladder and how it's unique to fish how the the fish use a swim bladder to control depth. They can deflate the bladder to reduce their volume and become more dense, therefore sink, or inflate the bladder, gain volume, be, gain more buoyancy, and therefore come up to the surface. In fishing tournaments, bass fishing tournaments, we've discovered a kind of an interesting phenomenon that if you catch a fish that is deep, let's say 40, 60 feet, and bring it to the surface, some fish are unable to manipulate the air bladder to the point that when you release them, they can regain that deep water position that they had. In other words, they just kind of flop and flounder right there at the, at the surface. So I'd like to talk about fish fizzing. Let's, let's take a look at this video. I'm Doug Hannon and I'm here with Charles Stewart. You know, many people in the tournament organizations have become pioneers. They've learned to find a way to contribute and they've learned how to contribute to the success of our live release and tournaments. And Charles is one of those guys that's realized that fish, when they're caught, have to have neutral buoyancy. When a fish is in the water, it's required that it not sink and it not float. And it does that by a mechanism called the swim bladder, which is nothing more than an air bubble in the fish. But everyone that's gone down to the bottom of the swimming pool knows that they feel that squeeze on their ears. And as you get deep, the bladder is squeezed and shrinks, and it's less buoyant. When you bring fish up from deep water, they act like this fish here, where they can't get down. And in many cases, that inability to get down can kill the fish. So what Charles is here to do is show us how to remedy this situation. Right now, what you're seeing is one fish that's normal. He's level and he's buoyant, and he doesn't have to have any effort to stay where he is. This fish just behind him actually has to have his tail up in the air and be swimming, trying to reach the bottom. And guess what? The one on the top has completely lost it. Charles, let's show everyone how we can fix this problem that these fish have and make them all like this one that's healthy and happy. Okay, sir. The, uh, the best way that i found to do it, uh, helping these tournaments out, is to get a hold of the fish, mm -hmm. try and cup it in your hand, lay this fin flat. Just let it lay out like it normally does flat. Turn the needle where the flat side is down. Come back about two or three scales past the top end of that fin and slide it under the scale until you can feel it go through, just like that. Then you want to come up and go straight down. Look at the bubbles come out. See the bladder letting that extra air go, and that's all extra air. And the best way to do it is to hold this needle and put your hand on the fish like this, and when okay. you feel him starting to let the pressure off, you take the needle out. And there he goes. And there he goes. So all you're gonna do is remove that needle as soon as the fish loses buoyancy, stops pushing up on your hand. Yes, sir, as soon as you feel that pressure coming off your hand, you wanna take that needle out, and that fish will swim a little just like it was out naturally in the lake. That's excellent be caught another day, yeah. These methods have been tried and true and proven. As you can see, we've got nothing but healthy, neutral ebullient fish in this tank, ready to take their place back in the world. And you know, there's schools of thought on this that have advocated many ways of doing it, one of which involves going down in the mouth through the throat. 
where the bladder is actually accessible, but there are so many vital organs so close and so much in peril that we don't recommend this. We recommend that you do the method that Charles Stewart advocates and has been a big part in developing and has proven successful. Go through the side of the fish. That's the most secure way to make sure those fish will survive. All right, show of hands. How many people before today knew what fish fizzing was? Yeah, just kind of kind of unique. I remember uh, several years ago, we took a vacation out to uh, the Seattle, Washington area, and bumming around the the shoreline, the piers, the docks. Um, I kept noticing these signs about rockfish. And now rockfish is a very popular uh, saltwater species out there. And they, they typically live very, very deep, um, 90, 120 feet deep. And the DNR out there was having an awful problem with fishermen catching the rockfish, bringing them up, and not eating them. You know, catch and release was really, well, catching on and they ended up with all of these rockfish you know floundering sorry at the surface and not able to get back into deep water uh the eagles absolutely loved it because this (laughs) i mean you don't get an easier target you know than a great big you know large rockfish um struggling at the surface so DNR came up with a, a scheme to try to get help fishermen help the fish that they were catching. And what they had suggested was that they find a uh, plastic milk crate and line the, the perimeter of the milk crate with some type of weight, anything from you know lead, uh, steel rod, Uh, rebar bricks whatever and the idea was that when you turn that crate upside down and tied a rope into the center of the crate you could catch your rockfish dehook it put it back in the water but of course with the inflated air bladder it couldn't get back couldn't get back to depth so you would put this inverted crate over top of the fish and the weight would, it's kind of a, an elevator effect, sink the fish down to the bottom. So you take this fish that's struggling on the surface, put them inside this crate, send them 100 feet deep, and it worked beautifully. You know, for the people who would do it, other people didn't do it. And they also encouraged people to eat their rockfish that they caught. So anyway, I thought that would be a, just kind of an interesting uh, little aside uh, showing how the anatomy of the fish and fishing, you know, are kind of interrelated there. Here is the uh, URL if, you're, if anyone is really interested in. Speaking of, uh, if you notice, this is um, BassResource.com. Bass fishermen out there, you need to visit this, this website. They have just tons and tons and tons of really useful, really interesting uh, information. Moving on. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the hearing ability of, of fish. So I, I pose another question to you. Can a shark hear you screaming as he's biting off your legs? Just think about that for a minute. I mean, how good is the, the, the hearing of, 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 uh, of fish? Um, we, we talked last unit about how fish can pick up uh, sounds and vibrations, uh, how to walk quietly along the shoreline or, or the, 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 the stream side. Uh, sound travels four, four times faster in 
water than it does in air. And I'd like to go a little bit deeper into the relationship between the actual hearing mechanism and the lateral line in, in fish. And a lot of this comes down to frequency that the two organs operate at. Down here we see that we have the, the inner ear. Not quite the way ours operates structurally, but it kind of accomplishes um, the, the, the same thing. That inner ear is responsible for picking up long-range sounds, where the lateral line on both sides of the fish is, is more attuned to close-in sounds the inner ear in this illustration is, is picking this bait up at, at about 50 feet. But the, the lateral line is, is really only going to be used in very, very close range. Kind of the, the, the final you know, attack sequence where, where the, the fish is, is maneuvering to actually you know, capture the, um, um, his meal. And if you look down here under frequencies, we can see that the lateral line is between about 1 hertz up to around you know, 200 hertz. But the probable hearing range is between about 35 and, I don't know, 500 hertz. And it's really interesting that if we look at the hearing range of minnows and catfish all the way up to 13,000 hertz. And if you've ever had a, a lure that just really caught fish, I think that particular lure was just kind of tuned probably by accident to really mimic the, the frequency that the fish were looking for. Because you, you, could have, you could have five of the same exact lure. One of them will outperform all the other ones. At least that's kind of been, been, been my experience. Uh, that's not scientific at all. That's just something I, I made up there. So here, here, here's you know, just a, uh, some other things to think about. Uh, we will take a look in a couple weeks at artificial lures and how well this is one place where 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 sound where noise actually becomes a good thing let's talk more about smell you, you know we yeah fish smell especially after about three days and we we talked about catfish and and how um they are basically one giant nose. There's olfactory nerves over their entire body. Um, they use that sense to to find food. They're very much a nocturnal um, a feeder, and so they're not relying upon eyesight uh, virtually at all. And if you also remember, with the catfish, they have the barbels that they can use to help pick up. Um, uh, here's an illustration that each one of these dots is, in essence, a nose or an olfactory nerve. So you can see the entire body of this fish. And if you really take a deep dive into this, uh, certain species of catfish are smell better. They have a greater ability to smell, i.e. more olfactory nerves than, than other species. I mean, somebody's really spent a, a whole bunch of, of time on this. Let's talk about the fish brain. Um, we, we hear 
you know, stories, you know, about dolphins, you know, being very intelligent, maybe more intelligent than, than humans. Um, they have a very, very large brain. They use echolocation to, to find their, their food. Um, bass, mm, not so much. And if you take a look at, you know, the brain, um, they have all the parts that we have, the, uh, the, 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 the cerebellum, the cerebrum, uh, the, the medulla, uh, pituitary gland, uh, olfactory tract, especially prominent in the, uh, the, the catfish uh, family. But my question is, how long can fish remember something? They're, 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 you know, scientists consider them a reflex animal, that, that they just operate off of instinct. Um, that they, they don't really have a cognitive uh, process. But I don't know. Um, I've seen fish, if they know that you're there, they're just not going to open their mouth for the next 45 minutes, um, two hours, if they're, they're heavily pressured. I, and these are the older fish, the bigger fish, the wiser fish. So to say that they don't think, I'm not so sure about that. I, I, I think that they, they, they certainly become harder to catch the older and bigger that they, that they are. This reminds me of a story my, my grandfather um, told me that up in Pennsylvania, there was a, uh, a, a creek that, that ran behind their, their property. And it was a good trout stream. Uh, not, not terribly large. I mean, probably average depth, a um, couple feet. Uh, some of the deep holes would probably be 8 to 10 feet uh, deep. And it never dried up. Um, you know, so it was a, a year-round uh, stream. And there was a big brown trout that that lived in this one particular stretch and everyone tried to get that that trout uh some people had had uh, hooked up with the trout um uh was never able to to land it and the the this the stories grew the the fish grew in size with the stories and the old timers would come out and they would debate in the, the in the barber shops, you know, on how to catch this trout and and the various theories, but but no one actually was able to do it. And my granddad said that he had listened to these stories, and in every one of them, the old men would say something like. Yeah, I waded that stream, you know, from this bridge down to the hole, and I knew he was in there, and da da da, so on and so forth. And somebody else would say, "Well, <clears throat> I crossed Old Man Segrick's property, and and came in from the the east side, and put a a, a, a streamer into the hole, and and you know, hooked me, and the story would go on." Every time somebody approached the fish, my granddad figured out the fish could see them. And so he devised a plan that early in the morning, he got up and went to Old Man Cedric's property. This was a, uh, there was a, a pasture that was between the, the road and the stream that you had to get across. Now, the, the problem with, with crossing Old Man Cedric was uh, not Old Man Cedric, but rather Old Man Cedric's bull. Uh, the bull was um, uh, protective, I think is how my, my grandfather uh, described him. And he didn't like anybody in his pasture. So you had to figure out where the bull was first. And if the bull was over under the willow trees, and you started on the other side of the pasture, there was a good possibility that you could make it across the pasture and under the fence near the stream before the bull arrived. Uh, 
and so my my grandfather had this all all planned out he had a, his fly rod his uh, uh, bait can his his very meager tackle and he saw where the bull was up under the widow willows and he, he got down and he he crawled he was a young man you know he was he was probably well in, in high school um, and he started to crawl and um, by the way, my, my grandfather being in, in high school was uh, 1914. So he, he started to crawl through the pasture. He figured, why do I have to, to run across the pasture if the bull doesn't see me? So he stayed low and kind of creeped across. Uh, got about halfway across, and then the bull saw him. The bull came charging. Granddad took off and made it right under the fence um, just a, a few yards before the uh, the bull got there so uh, exciting fishing and so he he <laughs> laid on the other side of the uh, the fence listening to the bull huff and puff and, and paw at the ground caught his breath caught his bearings and decided that he was going to launch his plan so what he did is he was still lying down. He rolled onto his back. He reached into his, his uh, bait can. The day before, he had caught some grasshoppers. So this would have been August, September time frame. And on the end of his fly rod, he had a, a short leader, probably, I don't know, maybe two or three feet. And he tied... The, uh, the grasshopper on, uh, um, onto the hook. And then he started crawling a few yards to the edge of the bank. And he knew where the big hole was, where the, the big brown trout lived. And <clears throat> he crawled until he was just maybe two yards away from the edge. But... He did not, and he really emphasized this to me, he did not walk up to the edge of the bank and look over into the water. So he's lying on his back about six feet away from the edge of the bank. There's, there's tall grass there. He has his fly rod all rigged out. He mends out some line does kind of a false cast and unceremoniously flips his line up over the bank and he could hear the grasshopper just hit the water. And he said it was about two seconds after that grasshopper hit the water that he heard this this giant explosion and his line immediately went tight and started running and so he kind of grabbed onto the line and 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 got to his knees and then and got to his feet and 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 fought that fish and he had nailed it a lot of people had actually hooked up with a fish but none had landed the fish and he was determined that he was going to to be the first and he kind of maneuvered the fish downstream a little bit and he jumped down over to the bank and got down near near the shore and you know i forget the rest of the story did granddad actually land that fish I don't remember. But anyway, that's not the point of the story. The, the point of the story is that Granddad didn't let the fish see him before he actually presented the bait. So the, kind of the importance of, of sight and sound and, and hunting. You know, we really are hunting fish. And this was an old fish, a very, very wise fish. And... So do fish think? Mm, I really have to think that they do. Um, 
Young dumb fish, nah, <laughs> they don't. They don't think uh, you can catch bluegill, you know, all day long. Um, but but the old old fish, yeah, I, I I really think that that they that they do. So how big was that fish the granddad caught? If my grandfather had taken his tape measure out and and measured the fish, let's say it's 28 inches and measured the, the girth, the distance around the fish or the perimeter of the fish, if you would, um, circumference of the fish at the widest point. Let's say that was, um, I don't know, 12 inches. Um, and if you had applied the formula uh, girth squared, times the length divided by 800 that would have come out to be about a about a you know you know 12 pound brown trout which would be incredibly respectable so this is just a, a, a set of formulas that somebody probably a frustrated math major came up with uh, their volumetric uh, f uh, formulas and you can see with the various uh, Species, the, the formula varies a, a little bit, you know, different constants. Um, the general, if you have no idea what type of fish this is, you can use the uh, girth squared times the length divided by um, 800, which is the, uh, the, the, the trout formula. Um, you can see the, the walleye is, is, is different, where it's, you don't even have to measure the, the, um, girth of the fish but only take the, the the length of the fish so anyway i thought you might find that interesting so if you catch that whopper and you don't have the uh a scale nearby but you want some idea of how big that fish was uh, if you have a tape measure with you you can uh, figure this out and if you take a, uh, a photo of the fish you could actually pull the the measurements of the fish off of the photo if you know a known length of something in the uh, uh, in, in the photo so we will move on to species of fish <laughs>